when I started digging into the text, I was like, whoa, what's actually happening with Eve here is really, really sophisticated. And she, in so many ways, like Jesus in these narratives, suffers this violence from the rulers of the world and somehow comes out on the other end and becomes a savior figure in a lot of ways. In these texts, you know, we have this kind of perfect heavenly cosmic world and there's this rupture that happens and somehow this rupture is connected with wisdom or Sophia exploiting this connection between um, the rulers of the empire of the world. From this rupture come these rulers of the world and they're totally arrogant. They think they're gods and they're not. And this main god, Yaldabaoth, kind of claims, oh, I'm God and no one else exists besides me. And this voice from the divine realm and says, you're wrong, Samael. And um, they get really jealous of this voice. They're like, what the heck is this voice that is, you know, kind of usurping our power? And so they decide they're going to create this human being in order to try and seduce this voice that they hear from the heavenly realm. And they create Adam, the rulers kind of huffing and puffing and they can't make Adam stand up. Wisdom Sophia and Eve or life are all kind of connected with each other in the heavenly realm and Eve is sent down basically to send her breath into Adam and much like a god in the story of Genesis, um, he's he gets this breath and he gets a soul, but he can't stand up. And um, Eve, it says, and I love this line, it, it says that Eve's word became a work. And she says to him for him to stand and he stands up and says, just like he does in Genesis, I will call you mother of the li living for you have given me life. And um, the rulers see this and they get super, they're like, who is this woman? <laughs> Today's guest is Celine Lilly, PhD and Master of Divinity from Union Theological Seminary, New York City, with also a Bachelor's in Contemplative Psychology from Naropa University. She is a lecturer at the University of Colorado Boulder and an adjunct professor at University of Oklahoma and the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. She lectures nationally, most often with the Jesus Seminar, and has recently been named as an inaugural Dean of the West Star Academy. Links in the description. Celine is an author of The Rape of Eve, Transformation of Roman Ideology, and Three Early Christian Retellings of Genesis. The Director of Translations for a New New Testament, edited by Hal Tossig, and a co-author of The Thunder Perfect Mind, a New Translation Introduction. You really got to enjoy this conversation. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. And today I'm with Dr. Celine Lilly, who has written a book called The Rape of Eve, The Transformation of Roman Ideology in Three Early Christian Retellings of Genesis. Now, I'm working my way through this, and I love it. Your approach is it's genius, because I'll, I'll just, just, just start it off, and then I'll get your thoughts on the book and what it's about and you can tell people but like a lot of times you hear jesus as the second adam you know he's the next they compare him to adam they compare him to all the patriarch hardly ever do you see people comparing jesus to eve maybe he's the second eve so tell us about that yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, and I'm oh, where do I even want to start with this? So one of the really interesting things about these kind of retellings of Genesis, and we can talk more about this later about how I how I rope this in with Gnosticism or don't, um, and what I think is going on. But one of the things that I find fascinating is with these three retellings of Genesis, that really is the emphasis that you know Jesus is the new Adam, and we're focusing on Adam and what really it seems like happened in the interpretation of these texts that Eve was a throwaway again, kind of just like she is in Genesis. Eve's the one who brings sexual sin into the world. This is what's, you know, she's just, ah, eh, she's this terrible female character who's kind of doing um, same old, same old. And when I started digging into the text, I was like, whoa, what's actually happening with Eve here is really, really sophisticated. And she, in so many ways, like Jesus in these narratives, suffers this violence from the rulers of the world and somehow comes out on the other end and becomes um, and becomes a savior figure in a lot of ways. And I was like, this is a really different thing than I thought was in these texts when I, after I had kind of first encountered interpretations of them. It's such a brilliant approach because it's a, there's 
right away right off the bat, I'm thinking of now I'm starting to look at the parallels, and there's a lot of that. Like that she, I mean, she's she's first of all, she's innocent. She doesn't really do anything wrong. She's just kind of like thrown in the middle of a garden and like, oh look, there's a tree. Don't touch that one tree. I'll be right back. And and then a serpent comes out of nowhere and is like, oh yeah, I just had this tree, and you'll be like a god. And it's like, did the serpent actually lie to her? Not really, because she didn't die. And she ate the ate the um the fruit, and she was her eyes were open. It's like, so I'll, when you go back to the text with this new approach, you're like, wow, this actually makes a lot of sense, you know? Yeah. And when you follow that thread, you can kind of see what these elaborations are actually playing with, and you know these pieces that you find in Genesis where. Um, Adam is actually the one who calls her mother of the living. So, you know, what's that about? And in these stories, it ends up being then Eve is the one who gives Adam life. Like these lowly rulers um, kind of huff and puff and they can't breathe life into him. And, and Eve is the one who does this. So in so many ways, then again, like Jesus in, um, in the Gospels, in extra canonical texts, Eve is the one who's bringing true life into um, really into creation um, and to humanity. And then once again, with the eating of the tree, she's the one who brings this fantastic knowledge, much in the same way that um, that Jesus does. And I'm thinking of another um, text from Nag Hammadi right now, the Gospel of Truth, where it actually talks about um, Jesus being um connected with the tree of knowledge there as well. So, so there are these really interesting connections that happen, um, particularly in these later strains of, I mean, do you even want to call it Christianity at this point? Whatever's happening with these Jesus folks during the time. Right. Yeah. That's not, that is a really interesting. Way. Like, what do you call that? I mean, it, 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 do you think this is a, a mostly an Egyptian or do you think this was a going back to the early Christians? This was universal. Like, do you do you have a, do you have an idea what that could be? I feel like this is an area that I'd love to spend the next twenty years researching. That you know, like what's what's actually happening here, and you know, if we pl if we put it in a place like like these texts in a place like Alexandria, where you have a history, particularly of um, Jewish interpretational methods, you know, what's actually what's happening with these texts and. For such a long time, I think um, because of the ways in which uh, texts like Secret Revelation of John, um, Apocrypha of John, whatever, whichever term you want to use for it, has been associated with things like Greek mythology, um, Greek and Greek and Roman philosophy. There's been this, um, and I think because you know the um, Yaldabaoth, this other god who shows up in these texts, has been conflated with the God of the Hebrew um, Bible, which I actually think is, I think there's a more complicated story um, there in these kind of reinterpretations. A lot of them have been framed as anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. And when I look at the reading techniques they're using, I'm actually like, yeah, this reminds me a lot more of Midrash than it does of Christian reading techniques. So, you know, I have a bunch of questions about, you know, are these, you know, are these Jewish Christians? What's the influence of, um, clearly they seem to be coming from a cosmopolitan area because of the wide range of influences that are going on. Um, and I'm sure you're gonna bring this up um, too in the course of, of, of our talk today. But, you know, I see a lot of kind of pushing up against the status quo in the society of the time yeah. too in these texts. And so they're, um, they're both very sophisticated, but also um, one of the charges I think against them a lot of the time is that they're elitist. And um, the like, which elite are we talking about? What's actually going on? And I think we're just at the cusp of asking better questions about what's going on with the text. But I, but I think this question of of Egypt and possibly in Alexandria to me would be a huge one, um, and one that really um, is begging for years more of research yeah and then if we look if we take eusebius if we take his account of how mark he, he claims that mark was in alexandria with peter when the when the gospel of mark was written so then it makes you what if that's true he could be wrong i mean this is like centuries later but if that is true then that makes you wonder: did christianity actually start in egypt like was there was there like a movement that happened in in Jerusalem that and then made its way down to Egypt and that's when all these gospels get written like that's another 
thing I keep thinking about. Maybe that's possible. I mean, it's a I, it's a really interesting question, and I don't think there's been enough work around it. I mean, you know, I feel like with you know New Testament scholars, when we don't know where something came from, we're always like Syria, yeah. <laughs> Syria, and and why um why do we really limit it to that little area? And um and I think you know really quickly when we start to look at um you know this this whole area people are so easily traveling back and forth obviously it takes a long you know it takes longer than today but it's it's we can see so clearly um the spread of different literatures the contacts that people have and i just think there's no reason not to at least play out scenarios seriously where we ask the very questions that you're asking what 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 if this started in Alexandria? What are the different questions we could ask about this? And what can we see in the text that actually might support um, that hypothesis and see what bears out? And then especially when you look, when you go back a couple of decades and you look at Philo of Alexandria yeah. and the stuff that he's talking about, if, if what he's saying is mainstream theology of the time and, and location, then I'm, I'm not surprised at all that this thing blew up in Egypt in Alexandria and I but like you said the traveling thing I mean at, at the, if, if we're to put ourselves in this in this time period people who are trading goods and services through you know the seafarers or you know traders that are on the roads what are they buying they're buying they're not buying movies they're not buying like video games they're buying scriptures to read they're that's the entertainment like they're buying written stories the Aeneid the the Odyssey whatever oh it's metamorphosis but probably Christian text too, you know? So you have to wonder, maybe that's, maybe this was like a, a, a new, a new thing. Like people just like this, these type of stories, you know? And, and we know that, you know, so many of the early Christian stories do copy these other genres of, you know, we get like Paul and Thecla, which looks like a uh, uh, Greek and Greek and Roman, ro like romance novels. Yeah. Based romance novel in that case. But, you know, we get these things that, that it is, you know, just to stay, we learn through entertainment. And why wouldn't we think that that's, that's possible in these cases too? You know, along like I'm getting my spices and, oh, look at this. Here's, here's a manuscript that, you know, um, my patron might really like. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> Gospel of Mary. Let's check it out. Let's see what it's about. But um, so in your book, you, you mentioned that these, these three particular books on the origin of the world, the reality of the rulers and the secret revelation of John. In these texts, Eve is portrayed as having been humiliated by the cosmic powers, yeah. yet experiencing restoration. Mm -hmm. So can you take us through that a little bit? So um, so basically, and I always like to let people know that um, these texts fe feature sexual violence heavily, so I will be talking about this. Um, but so um, in these texts, you know, we have this kind of... Um, wonderful, perfect, uh, heavenly, uh, cosmic world. And there's this rupture that happens and somehow this rupture is connected with, um, wisdom or Sophia. Mm. And from this rupture, these rulers of the world, and they do talk, they talk about them as archons a lot of the time, but I do also wonder, um, and this is one of my hypotheses that it's really kind of exploiting this connection between, um, the rulers of, you know, the empire of the world. Um, this comes from Karen King's work, just to kind of give a shout out around that. Um, but um, that um, that sh that from this rupture come these rulers of the world, and they're totally arrogant. They think they're gods, and they're not. And this main god Yaldabaoth kind of claims, "Oh, I'm God, and no one no one else exists besides me." And this voice comes from the from the divine realm and says, you're wrong, um, Samael. And um, they get really jealous of this voice. They're like, what the heck is this voice that is, you know, kind of usurping our power? And so they decide they're going to create this human being in order to try and seduce this voice that they hear from this, the heavenly realm. And they create Adam and um, in On the Origin of the World in particular, which I just, I think this scene is supposed to be hysterical of, um, you know, the the rulers kind of huffing and puffing and they can't make adam stand up and so um 
Wisdom Sophia and Eve or life are all kind of connected with each other in the heavenly realm. And Eve is sent down basically to send her breath into Adam. And much like a God in the story of Genesis, um, he's he gets this breath and he gets a soul, but he can't stand up. And um, Eve, it says, and I love this line, it, it says that Eve's word became a work and she says to him for him to stand and he stands up and says, just like he does in Genesis, I will call you mother of the li living for you have given me life. And um, the rulers see this and they get super, they're like, who is this woman <laughs> who's coming in and doing this? So they basically decide that they are going to try and steal her power by raping her. And she knows because she's a divine power that this is going to happen ahead of time. And her spirit actually goes into the tree of knowledge. And this is the super, um, I think it's super psychologically savvy. I'm um, thinking about what we know about trauma theory today, that somehow she knows this violence is going to happen. This part of her, her spirit splits out so that her body experiences the violence, but her spirit is in the tree of knowledge and um, the rulers violate her. And again, really interestingly in, um, in uh, on the origin of the world, they, they tell that story where they put Adam to sleep, you know, they put Adam to sleep and take Eve from his rib. And basically what they say is they put a sleep on Adam and tell him a story that Eve came from his rib so that woman would be subordinate to man and that their children would be subordinate to these rulers. So, um, they, they rape her and then both of them later, then they're put in the garden. Wow. And they're told not to eat from the trees. And um, the serpent comes along and the serpent is another one of these creatures from the divine realm. So this kind of female conglomeration of, um, of divine beings who's sent down and says to Eve, you know, what did they tell you about the tree? And she's like, don't touch it or you don't eat it or don't touch it or you're, you'll die. And the serpent's like, nope, that's not what's going to happen. And um so she basically trusts um, this creature from the divine realm, eats the fruit from the tree, um, gives some to Adam, and he eats too, and their eyes are opened, and they actually become partners. It calls them, the text actually calls them co-workers, and they see... Um, they see that these rulers are beasts, and it actually says that they can tell the difference between e evil humans and good. So it's a really interesting kind of spin on um, spin on what's happening, and this really, really creative um, elaboration of the Genesis story that really turns it on its head in certain ways. It does so much, and it actually is backed up biblically because you look in certain parts of the Bible, like in um, Proverbs where it talks about mm -hmm. Sophia being the creator of all things wisdom yeah. and then in, in the wisdom of Solomon is wisdom was the one who created the first form father which is Adam so Sophia is the creator in the Bible not this is not even Gnostic apocrypha attack this is canon and then you and then another thing I noticed about this it sort of echoes the mysteries the the, the uh, Ishtar yeah. and and illusion and mysteries with you know Persephone Demeter, yeah. So what it's it's what it's doing is it's sort of tying in all of this mythology and making this like amazing masterpiece that I think needs to be talked about more. Because it's really good. Yeah. It's I mean, it's awesome. And these influences too. And again, you know, you get Ishtar, you get um Demeter and Persephone. And again, it's these resurrection myths, but with women right. at the center of them. And so it and it they're is, older. Say that again. And they're older. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> um, so so they're really um yeah, doing this again. Um, and you know, just to say too, as you're talking about what's happening in Proverbs, wisdom of Solomon, we get a gesture to this too in Job, um, with wisdom being um there in the beginning as well, um, of um of really using these Jewish reading techniques where you have Midrash with a text and a counter text and they're brought together and then read together. And so you see Genesis and Proverbs being read together, but then here you might be getting, you know, alongside of it, Demeter in, um, in, uh, on the origin of the world explicitly, the story of, of Eris and Psyche shows up right in the middle of it. So it's, so it's very, very explicitly, um, bringing in these different, and if you, again, um, you know, looking through these texts, you'll find echoes of 
Paul's letters, of the Gospel of Mark, of the Gospel of John. And so they are just kind of taking this text and countertext to the nth degree and using every resource in their purview um, to reflect on their lives, on their world, um, in the most creative um, and um, and also, as you notice, faith. There, it's not just creative, but they're also really faithful to these texts that they're relying on. Right, and that's that's a really good point. Is but that's that's something I think we should focus on real quick because these aren't like heretical, outside and left field, like completely missing the mark when it comes to the theology of the ancient Hebrews. This is line. It lines up the, theologically with the Old Testament, the New Testament. And like, it, it, I think of it like this. Would you say that a Protestant is any less Christian than a Catholic? No, they're just different kinds of different theologies, but they're still, they still have the same core belief in who Jesus is. He's died for your sins. Well, I would think the same about these Gnostics or whatever you want to call them. Some people call them Gnostics and we'll just call them Christians that live in Egypt, whatever. But, but I would say the same thing. They're not in a different category as far as religion they're just they see it differently and they have a different imp- interpretation but they're also they're also rooted and grounded in the text yeah. so it's not like they're like making stuff up that's like oh this is ridiculous this is like okay this actually let this actually lines up you know what i mean well and you know i think i think too you know talking about the different denominations is such a good way to get into this and then if you look at like Ethiopic Christianity today, or Thomasine Christianity in Southern India, or even the Eastern Orthodox Church versus, you know, Western um, Catholicism, you start to see like the the really multiple ways that um, that Christianity manifests contextually in its environment. And one of the things that that as I've played with these texts more and more, that I wonder, um, you know is one of the things if we're if we're thinking about like you know what is this knowledge supposed to tell us today if one of the things for one of the questions we're actually supposed to ask is how are these folks using the Jesus story the scriptures in really creative ways to make to make very specific meaning of their contemporary situations and what if what we're supposed to learn is that creativity rather than taking this as like a doctrine that we're supposed to follow um you know by every um every you know each and every line exactly as it is and i think about just even in churches today synagogues wherever you know people um take a piece of scripture, whoever, you know, the pastor, the rabbi, whoever, and they look at their contemporary world, they look at their community, and they write a sermon to make new meaning of it. And what if that's actually what these folks are doing in the very same way to say, look, this is what's going on in my world. These are the resources that I have at my disposal. And what would it look like if we brought these things together to really make a new kind of creative, holistic meaning of our world? Yeah, I think you're. I think you nailed it on the head right there. That's probably what it was happening. And then for some reason, when you said that, I thought of Josephus because I was where I was. I did a video with James Tabor, um, and he before we even did the video, he's like, "I want you to read this chapter two and book two of Josephus, whatever it was. I forgot which one." And I read it just to get ready for the interview. And in that chapter, it's talking about how the Essenes. He he really wanted me to understand this thing. The Essenes were trained to take the old testament and reinterpret it in today's world. Yeah. So that's how the Essenes wrote their mythology. They would they would take they would take what was in the old testament and say okay, this happened with Jacob, but today it's happening with this person. And they would write the myth and redo it. And it almost looks like that's what's happening with the new testament. Um so but I, but back to what we're saying, this is probably the same thing. Yeah. This is probably what this is how mythology is done. You know, you take something that's sacred and then you like repurpose it. I mean, you know, mythology really is never about, it's never about the past. It's about putting the present into some kind of primordial past to justify and understand what's happening now. You know, whether it's our American mythology that gets recast again and again and again in particular ways to kind of justify whatever um, trajectories we find ourselves now in as a country or, you know, in the ancient world, like it's the same for, for me, it's the same thing. Like we recast these stories to both understand where we are, have some kind of um, 
have some kind of story to, to um, at least that we tell ourselves of where we've um, come from, you know, like everybody knows that, um, you know, uh, George Washington probably didn't chop down the apple tree, but this is part of our national kind of mythology. Um, and, and, but it gives us a sense of um, whoever the we is in that moment, but it's, we, we, we put it in the past so that we can see kind of where we're striving to go. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's a, it's a, it's also a pretty useful way to 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 remember the like you know to to take note of history. Yeah. Like if you're going to pass down history, you could write down like you say hey this happened, then yesterday that happened and yesterday this or you can sort of make it, you know, glorify it and sort of you know spice it up and It'll probably be way easier to remember it that way, you know, I and mean, turn it into a psalm or something. Like that's seems like that's a more effective way to pass down history, you know. One of my one of my professors in um when I was getting my PhD, uh, Hal Tausig, uh, he would always tell the story of his his uh, seminary professor who said, um, "Thank God they wrote." they didn't write down what happened, but they wrote down what it meant. And that meaning um, is the thing that kind of fleshes it out and it gets, you know, it cuts right to the point of, so why, why is this really important? Um, and then we get that philosophical piece underneath rather than the, um, and then, you know, Jesus, you know, walked for 30 miles and it was dusty and this day he <laughs> ate you know this kind of fish and right. da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah that's a good point um and so the secret revelation of john in that particular text what did you see that's because this is this one this is a really um how, how do you say it? this is a complicated text like i even even today i'll read it three times in a row and be like what the hell did i just read so what do you when you and as far as the context of what we're talking about, what, what what did you see there that might be interesting? Oh, so again, you know, Secret Revelation of John um, is another one that I just think the work that that continues to kind of need to that needs to be done on it is exponential. And I think the first thing, and I'd say this about most of these texts, um, this is I think a little bit of my shtick around this is that I remember reading them too, and um, I do also want to kind of thank my um, my intellectual and Coptic uh, American Coptic uh, experts um, who on whose shoulders I stand exactly. um, who did all this work of um, of translating and and um, really delving into the possibilities of these texts. But one of the things that I found um, as I um, as I was learning about them more, and then particularly as I started to learn Coptic, was that I found the translations, um, first of all, really, really difficult, that they used a lot of transliteration rather than translation. There were a lot of, um, in my opinion, very spiritualized choices in um, the words that were chosen even in English um, to, to use. And um, and so I think they're even more opaque because of the translations a lot of times than they would be um, Otherwise, um, so secret revelation of John, there are so many things that are um, so complex about it, including, and I'm just going to say, I'm not an expert on this. It was not one of the areas that I focused on, but I do think about it quite regularly, <laughs> but things like putting together Adam's body with all of these different kind of deities, archons, names that attach to the different body parts, um, they're like, it's the creation of Adam, for example, is really, really elaborate. And again, Karen King has done some work on this of actually asking, is this a healing text? Like, are these the names that were invoked to heal these different body parts? And is that part of kind of what's being mapped in this? Um, Secret Revelation of John, um, you get... Um, in the Eve story, which is a little, which is a little different than the other two, um, which I also find fascinating is that when she's actually violated by Yeldeboth in this story, um, the text says that this is the beginning of, of um, marital intercourse. 
and um, which I thought was fascinating. And like, what is the comment on what's happening in Roman society with that? And also this idea that the woman is subordinate to the man was against the holy design, um, which I think is really, really fascinating. Um, the, um, the other thing that happens, I think in particular, in the in the secret revelation of john um at the very end and again i think it's a place that that um could use that needs a lot more work um but you get this kind of triple descent of sophia at this triple descent of um that happens kind of at the end that follows um what we see you know in um with sophia with jesus in um in the gospel of john and um but there's this really interesting piece that happens at the end you get um um it continues to kind of explore genesis through uh through the noah scene but there's also some very very specific critiques kind of of imperial religion of um of imperial exportate exploitation, in this case, using something like um, Enoch, so Jewish apocryphal texts, um, to kind of bring that in. So, um, sorry, that's kind of all over the place. Well, I start to get oh, into the text, I'm like, oh, there's so much exciting stuff here. Yeah, oh, this is good. This is great. Um, but um, I feel like the most streamlined of the three is reality of the rulers. But um, so Secret Revelation of John, I feel like uses a lot more um, in certain ways you get... Um, you know, along with Greek and Roman influence, you get a lot more of this kind of in-depth um, use of the of more of the Jewish materials um, that happens there, and um, and it's all narrated, which is really fascinating. Jesus comes right at the beginning. Um, Jesus comes to John of um, Zebedee, kind of in this triple form. It's almost like a. Um, a kind of a recasting of the transfiguration. And he basically is telling the story to John and saying like, this is, this is the real deal. Like you didn't get this anyplace else. Right. But, um, and every time John asks questions. So it's, so in that one, what's really interesting is that it's, it's also this, um, it, it occurs in the form of a dialogue between the risen savior and, um, and John. So, um, yeah, there's yeah, it's there's a there's a lot there. And again, I I really think we're still just at the tip of the iceberg of, right. of trying to um extrapolate what might be go. I don't even want to say what is going on, but what might be going on in these stories. Yeah, you made a really good point on, on these these texts are Coptic and yeah. there's we, we have to go off what's translated by the people who know Coptic and then a lot of times what, what happens with these texts is centuries can go by and then a, some new person who's like an extra whiz in Coptic will retranslate a text and then be like, okay, this, this might be different. But all of a sudden this context changes a little bit. Yeah. And like you see that with like old translations of the New Testament compared to newer translations. So like I wonder if that's, that's in store for us, you know, later on. But it, regardless of the fact is like these are really complicated texts with a lot of a lot of words that get transliterated and um and but what what i was going to get at is that in this particular text it, 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 do you think that there's because a lot a lot of people i talk to when I, when I get in these conversations there's this debate between are, are these christian texts pro-roman or anti-roman sometimes it's hard to tell but at, at there's there's you can see it both ways and i think i think in these texts there's a lot of anti-roman stuff and there's a lot of like rejection of the imperial ideology. So what do you think, what do you think in this text or, or even just all these texts, what do you, what do you, what do you see in particular? So I definitely think they're anti-Roman. I think yeah. there's no, I think there's no doubt in my mind. Um, again, this is an area that I, that I would like to do more work on. And it was one of the places in, um, in this work generally that I was like, I need to spend a lot more time doing Hebrew and, and learning, you know, it's the, it's a moment where I think, oh, I'm an, I'm a new Testament and early Christian scholar. And there's a, there are a lot of things that, that I don't know around this, but one of the things that I started playing with was, um, you know, one of the places that a lot of meaning ha has been made is that there are two creation stories here. So you get, um, so you get this kind of creation of the, the perfect divine realm, and then you get the creation of the material world. And um, this has been um, correlated. A lot of people talk about it. it's a reading of um, 
of Plato's Timaeus alongside um, the two stories of creation that we actually get in the Genesis narrative. So um, one through about, I think it's like two, seven, we get one creation narrative in um, Genesis and um, where man and woman are created in the image of um, let us create, um, let us create a human being in our image, man and woman, we will create them and and the human beings created. And then we get this whole second creation story that's Adam and Eve. And interestingly in this, um, there are two names uh, for God that are used. And um, we get um, Elohim is the one that's used in the first creation story. And then we get Yahweh, which happens in the second creation story. And these are translated. So in the Greek Septuagint, these get translated as Theos is the word for that's used for God in um, the first part. And then um, kurios, which is the word that's used in the second. And kurios is the word that we translate as Lord a lot of the time and also would have been um, the uh, one of the ways in which um, the Roman emperor was referred to with this word kurios. And, um, and interestingly, um, in I... If I'm if I'm remembering this right, so in um, in kind of Israel, Yahweh was kind of thought of as the more personal um, deity, and then Elohim, kind of the more kingly one. But interestingly, in Alexandrian um, uh, in in Alexandrian Jewish um, interpretations, these are flipped around, and so the kingly imperial one is Yahweh. Kurios. And my and I wonder sometimes if this is around the Greek. So if you look at these two things, it becomes a really easy way to say, ooh, isn't this fun? So Theos, who did this first creation narrative, is like the real one God from, um, from the heavenly realm. And then we get this other guy who's kind of arrogant, who's anthropomorphized um, or has been read as anthropomorphized in the garden. And doesn't that remind us, the, us of the Roman emperors who like think they're gods. They try and pull the strings of all this stuff. They tell us what we can and can't do. They want to be worshipped. They want to be worshipped. They think they're the only gods that are out there, or at least the most important ones. Wow. They get jealous of other people and they make war on them. And um, and then the other thing, um, kind of looking at the Roman ideology, is that um, Rome's um, ideology of conquest, and this comes a lot just to, from the work of Davina Lopez, um, is is highly connected with sexual violence and um so so i started just asking these questions about what's um you know what if what if these are even more anti-imperial than we thought and what if they're bumping up against this ideology that conflates um subordination of the subordination of genders sexual violence and um conquest and colonization um, and and we get these stories from um, from Livy, from um, Plutarch, from um, Pliny, from you know all of these Roman historians and Greek historians, Dionysius of Halicarnassus, who are retelling kind of these founding stories of Rome um, that um, that basically once again get these ancient myths they get recast during the time of Augustus as he takes over and creates the Roman Empire, and then these are the primary stories that are circulating both. Um, in the written word orally and then in in the visual culture of the time and so what if um what if these early these early jesus folks who who whoever we want to call them are also reading this narrative alongside this and using these interpretational techniques that they already have to say whoa wait a second here's a critique of actually what's happening in our world today here you just said exactly what i've been like like I can, I could not put it that way, but like, it's like what that made the most sense because you, you can tell they're aware of these texts, but they're, they're not exactly pro these texts. They're not like trying to fulfill these texts, but they are, they are sort of polemicizing them in a way. And like you said, the Roman emperor is like, you go to Philo, for example, Philo has a, a story or what is it called on the embassy to Gaius? Are you feeling familiar with this one or no? It's been a long time since I've take, taken a look at it. So bring yeah, it up. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, bring it, I'll bring it up because I think this is a perfect example of what the, the mind, because he's a Jewish Alexandrian who's, who, who loves the Torah, loves the law. He writes about Moses, 
but he also loves Plato. He also loves all these. And so he's a prime example of someone we should look at to study this type of mindset. But anyways, in this, on the, on the embassy to Gaius, I forgot who he's writing to, but he's talking about Caligula and he's like, this Caligula is just the worst. He came here. He made us worship the image. He was, he he thought, we thought we're all going to die. This guy was a maniac. And then he compares him to Augustus when he says, but Augustus, he, he calmed the storms and the were raging in every direction and he made peace throughout the world. Why can't Caligula be more like Augustus? So then I think of this particular text and I wonder if the, you know, if Alexandrian Jews or Christians, Jesus folks like you, like you, that's a good way to describe them. I wonder if they sort of had a similar attitude where they weren't necessarily pro. They're probably mostly anti-Roman, but they're also open to like, okay, maybe the Roman Empire could be good. Maybe it could be a force of good if they stop encroaching on our worship or if they stop throwing us to lions, if they stop doing like they're, I think it's more like they're open to there being goodness coming from the empire, but they're also extremely critical and they know that God's going to save them in the end. So I think there's a little bit of, I think that's why it gets so confusing. And I think that's why you have like, for example, Pilate being like, I didn't do this. You guys did. It's like, instead of them just being like, Pilate just killed them because they could have just wrote Pilate killed. But instead they had to make it a certain weird, like, it's not on my hands. It's on your hands. So you're like, wait, is Pilate the one who does this? Is he not? So and that's like the sort of mindset you get throughout all these texts where you can't, you can tell they're not pro Roman. Like it's pretty obvious they're not, they're not pro Roman, but that's like, but then you're like, but are they anti Roman? It's like, that's, that's what I'm trying to get at. Well, and I, th- I mean, this is a great question. And I think, you know, and I, I'm sure I fall into this trap too, where, um, you know, just as we have polarization in our world today, we map it onto the ancient world. And of course the story is really more complex, right? And, right. and, and it's not, it's not either or, um, but I do, you know, I, the question that you're asking is great. And I, I also wonder too, like, you know, it's like, well, you know, if we're being um, like Pliny's letters to Trajan, where we kind of have this first, um, one of our first real glimpses of, at some of the um, ways in which the Romans are dealing with the, um, with this new Christian group. And, you know, we know they're getting tortured. And we also have Trajan kind of saying, um, and my students are always surprised by this, where, you know, they think the Romans are also all bad all the time. And it's like, Trajan's like, dude, don't go after them. Don't stoke this, don't stoke this fire further. You know, we really want to, we really want to give people an opportunity to come back into the fold. And we don't want to create a situation where people can just get like rid of some dude they don't like, or some, you know, you know, one of their employees, they don't like by saying that they're a Christian. And then all of a sudden you're killing these folks. Like we don't want to, we don't want martyrdoms. We don't want this to actually gain steam by persecuting, by persecuting folks. And so we have, you know, like that kind of situation on one side. I sometimes wonder if, you know, people don't actually want to blame Pilate all the all the way because these texts are being written in the aftermath of the, of the destruction of the Jewish temple. And you go back and read Josephus after that, and you're like, these are people that we do not want to screw with. Like, we will die if we mess with these really people. Good point. It's a really good point. So, so like rhetorically, then it makes sense to say, um, you know what, maybe... Um, Maybe we want to blame this a little more on, um, on, and I'm going to use this, you know, because this is one of the places too that we now have a 2,000 year legacy of anti-Semitism because the Gospels, you know, gesture towards the Jews. But we need to remember that we were the Jews during that. Like this is written from that perspective, so right. it's saying like I'm going to blame myself a little bit. So maybe that, you know, maybe we won't all all get hung up on crosses too. Um, hmm. But I do think there's a huge question that's going on, um, and you can see this in in such a range of the early texts of how much are we going to accommodate to Rome or not? How dangerous is it if we? How dangerous is it if we um, don't accommodate? If we do accommodate, are we actually leaving our faith behind? And this, I too think, is one of the things that we see that you know whether it's Paul saying you know to um, most likely, um, 
Romans in um, in Rome in the in the letter to the Romans who are probably welcoming back um, Judeans who have been exiled and who who've been thrown out of Rome. They're coming back. He's like, you know what? Don't do anything to draw attention to the emperor, like draw the emperor's attention right now, because you're going to get your brothers and sisters who are Jewish in trouble again. And we don't want that to happen. And in other places, it really looks like, you know, Paul is Paul is saying, you know what? Don't eat the idol meat. Like, like, what are you all thinking? So, you know, we also even get a range within one person writing um, yeah. about like what what what's the best way, um, you know, what's the best way forward. And again, I think that's something that needs to be um that it will be helpful as we ask these questions and just nuance them more and more as we explore these texts. Yeah, you just brought up a lot of really good points that that I think is worth like thinking thinking about. Like it makes that makes a lot of sense. Um, because what well, like what good are these texts if we all get killed and they destroy these texts? If we want to get these texts to be preserved, we gotta do, you know, we have to phrase it in a certain way. And I think when you when you were talking about this, I thought of Revelation, which is a very in a very way, very Gnostic y, if you kind of it, it has that like and John if I mean it's probably not the same John, but like I think they're attributing to attributing to John because it's sort of similar style of like prophetic visions and dream like you know what i mean and so in revelation you get this uh dragon with the seven horns which is the seven hills of rome yeah. that's not pro roman i mean that's the dragon that's and the dragon loses to michael and his angels so what are they saying are they saying rome's going to fall babylon the great's going to fall i think that's what they're saying so I think that's one of those one of the texts we can point to and say, OK, these are not like Roman agents that are like, you know, these are people who are, are like they're Jews. They're they want their their particular hereditary line to win. They want to be the winners like they want God to save them. And so you have to factor that in, too. I think I think that's you know, I, I think you make a good make a really good point is that they're trying to walk the line, and not be too obvious with it. But if you actually look at it and dig into it, you see for what it is that they're true to who they are. Yeah. And, you know, just even thinking about then, you know, something. Yeah. And and I think you're absolutely like something like, um, yeah, John of Potmos with um, with Revelation. Like he is he's like no accommodation. He's like, nope, do do not accommodate to this at all. Right. Um, and and then we have kind of milder things. But again, you know, back to Josephus, like thinking about he you know, he basically says in the aftermath of this, you know, clearly God was with the Romans because we got um, because we got crushed. And so again, you get, you know, this range of range of rhetorical um, and I'm and in in practice too, you know, what is what does that look like? And I think, you know, another question of so then what are the what might the practices of someone reading secret revelation of John versus revelation versus, you know, um, you know, one of the Pauline letters. And um, and it's again, it's a wide range of stuff, um, whether it is uh how much are we conforming to the Roman family? Something like First Timothy, which um, most scholars don't think Paul wrote, but you know, the, which really makes the makes the church, the ecclesia, into a Roman household. And so you have God on top, and then Jesus, and then the bishops, and you start to get these different, um, right. you know, these different institutions of the church. And then, of course, women are at the bottom. Why are women at the bottom? Because of Eve. Um, and the only way that they'll be saved is if they're silent, they have a good household and they bear and they have babies. Um, so so uh, and um so again we get these ranges in um and then we have Junia, who's the you know, an apostle at the end of uh, again, Roman. Why am I quoting Romans so much today? Um, at, the, at the end of um Romans 16, where Paul names all of these women who are doing all kinds of things. And Junia is named as an apostle. So even within the canon, which we forget, there is this wide range of um, kind of pushing up against Roman norms and um, yeah. capitulating to them. Yeah, I think that's really, that's another really good point. And um, that brings us to the next, the, probably the last thing we'll get into is why do you, because th centuries go by before Christianity really blows up. Like it's really kind of a it's sort of like a thing that's going on in Egypt there. I mean, don't get me wrong. You have 
You have a bishop in Rome, Linus, before the first century is even over. I mean, he's he's there before the war even ends, before Jerusalem. So there's already Christianity all along the empire, but it doesn't really like take hold as it does, it, let's say, in like the fourth century. Yeah. And so what I, I'm wondering, like, and this is a big mystery and probably not going to answer this right now, but like, I'm wondering how do we get from such a diverse group of Christianities? You get the Ebionites, the Gnostics, you got these Marcionites, you got all these different different types of Christians. And then you get to, and this is a long period of time, but eventually you get to fourth century with Constantine and these Nicene Creed. And I almost wonder, why do you think this type of Christianity, this Pauline um, patriarchal, you know, the bishops and the, and the priests and the men run the church, what do you, what do you, why do you think that one is so successful compared to the other ones? You think it's maybe the, it fits good for a Roman empire, maybe? I mean, I do think that that's some of the reason. And, you know, if you have, um, it's hard to consolidate power and have control of people if everybody believes different things. Right. Um, I, I also do wonder about, um, you know, like thinking about, for example, someone like Irenaeus. So Irenaeus is, um, it's one of the places in um, what becomes, and I, there, we don't have good words for this, what becomes orthodoxy. Obviously there's no orthodoxy at the time. Right. Um, but it, it has a story very similar to what we find in something like the secret revelation of John. And so we, we get these myths and that's, and so we're talking about contemporary Southern France right now. So we know that these stories are actually by, you know, the end of the second century, they're in Rome, they're in France, they're in all of these places, you know, alongside Egypt, et cetera. But I think about someone like Irenaeus who, um, if I'm remembering the story correctly, he had gone, um, Oh, this is terrible and embarrassing and I'm not going to, but you know, it is okay. There was a heresy that was going on in his, um, in his community, um, that I can't believe it was at Montanus maybe, um, but that are going on in his community. And he, he travels to see the Bishop of Rome. And while he's gone, there's actually a martyrdom in his community while he's away and he gets back and these people have died. And I wonder about things like this too. Like what would the survivor's guilt of that? Like, I don't love Irenaeus's stuff all the time, but like, what would the survivor's guilt around that be? What does it look like if you are really worried about, um, again, um, threats to your community, what are the compromises that you make around things? What are the ways that you want to structure your community? And one of the ways, and again, um, not to say um, that um, this is necessarily the right way to go, but might be to say, you know what, our community really looks like your Roman communities. We're really safe. We really aren't pushing up against the emperor. We really don't want to subvert contemporary norms around things. Um, but there's also something I think that continues to be, um, which is which has to be one of the reasons why people, in my opinion, are attracted to this, that has to be um, appealing about these communities that um, there is still some kind of playfulness of men, um, of Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female coming together and um, taking care of one another, holding some kind of property in common so that people are taken care of in new, um, I don't want to say new, there were, other, there were other types of associations that were doing this type of work too, but there's something about Christianity that really, um, that really spreads. There are great authors who have all kinds of... Um, ideas about what that, um, you know, what that might be from, you know, Peter Brown to Judith Perkins, The Suffering Self. Um, but these authors have like all kinds of ideas. And I think, um, I do think that there are, you know, are more to come, are more theories to come. There's obviously something really, um, really attractive about what these folks are um, doing. But I, I do also think, you know, what's the easiest way to control people is to have some kind of centralized, um, governance. And that really is the direction that, that they're moving. And again, as I said, you know, it's, it's in this more non-threatening way because it looks like these Roman structures of government governance, particularly the patriarchal have sold. Yeah. And it's funny because when you, when you look at the difference between the Greek world and the Roman world is 
in the Greek world, for you had like women who were prophets, prophetesses doing um, oracles at, at Delphi, and they had all these big roles in religion. And and the and, but in the Roman world, it's a little more like I guess I'm I'm gonna say a, a Augustus and and going forward like post Augustus. So Augustus is like dedicates like seventy new temples, and he like revamps the whole empire to be like this really religious. He's like a religious reformer. And he's all he's he's got all these new edicts where yeah. he's really harsh on people. He wants people to you better get married and have a have a family and like he doesn't want anyone played around, no games, like this is better to be strict. Like he almost see like his sort of Roman world sort of like plants the seeds of what like the church world would be, even if it's not even if it's two different things. I still think his sort of like his way of controlling things becomes the norm. And like that's what happened when Christianity comes along and they just kind of marry each other. And like, I think if paganism would have kept going on and Christianity never became the church, it would have been the same thing. It just would have been pagan. I think you still would have had a similar church. You see what you would have you see, as a Pope, probably a Pontifus Maximus and probably some bishops underneath them. And you, you had the, um, instead of the nuns, you'd have the Vestal Virgins, maybe. I don't know. I'm just making stuff up. But like, I think it would have looked very similar. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I I feel like I I I want to think about that more. Um, and and partially because you know as the Roman Empire grew, you know one of their innovations was really having basically saying you know you can really worship your local deities and that's cool, but there's always this imperial religion piece. And I do think you're right that this that as time goes on, it really seems that the, that imperial religion piece starts to become more and more central as more and more people are, um, or more and more regions are becoming patrons of um, whoever's in power. And you get the temples to Augustus, the temp temples to the emperor that we now find spread throughout the throughout the Mediterranean, whether you're in Egypt or in, um, or you know even Herod's building, you know temples to Augustus. Three of them. Um, so. Um, so, but yeah, so it's really interesting to think about um, how, too, as the Roman Empire grew and became more unwieldy, they too then need this centralization. And I do also wonder, which I think is, is um, you know, what you're making me think about is the ways in which, you know, if you get like in the Talmud, in Judaism, you have um, multiple opinions from multiple rabbis, like Good sitting a, sitting next to one another that disagree. But there was always something about Christianity as it moves forward that they really wanted to narrow the interpretations, which also then makes it easier once you get to the fourth century, you have specific creeds um, that are happening in the fourth and fifth centuries, and you're really narrowing the scope of possible interpretations, which then makes it kind of ready-made to be taken up by um, a more sprawling empire in certain ways. Wow, that's a really good point. And um, we covered a lot in this. And uh, before we close out, anything else about your book that that you think that we forgot to bring up that you think would be pretty interesting? I mean, I think I think we hit. Um, you did. I think we hit. I think we hit almost all of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I just I think the thing that I'd say is that. Uh, you know, I, I think this is one slice of a way to look at it. And I think um, these texts are just begging for more folks to be reading them in complex ways. And um, I think, you know, Neil, as you said, um, you kind of gestured towards this earlier about, but like, you know, what's going to change in society and how will that change how we translate? How will that change how we see things? And one of the things that I do love about the Nakamadi text in general is that there's something that the public, the public has, they've really sparked this segment of the public's imagination. And so I just want to encourage like more people to read the text and to think about broader possibilities than what scholars a lot of times say about them, we too have gotten stuck in these categories where you have, and it's the reason why I don't use Gnosticism, I really want to look at this diversity, where it's like you have orthodoxy and you have the canon, and there's a there's a meta narrative around that, and they all conform to kind of one meaning. And then you get the Gnostic text or Nag Hammadi, and there's a meta narrative around that, and they all conform to one meaning. And if you start to look at these texts, whether inside or outside of the canon, and look at what's going on, which you do such 
a great job of, of looking at these broader influences from Greek and Roman culture, from Jewish culture, from the mysteries, and start to start to really open up possibilities. I just think, you know, there's work for everyone, scholars and lay folks alike, right. um, to be um, really um, finding new meaning within these texts and also um, seeing what they might inspire in us today. Absolutely. I th and like, there's enough to, for like 10 lifetimes of work, <laughs> more than that, hundreds. Like this is, there's just so much to dig into that everyone can play a part it's and it's fun and it, I, I enjoy it i really do so i put the link in the description for everyone who's watching for the book it's the it's um yeah the, it's in the description and um other links as well and so yeah go check that out it it's really good and i recommend it so um yeah and that is all for today and you have just attained true gnosis You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.